thing working against Tua here is by no fault of his own. And maybe more importantly, how are you doing as we sit here today? I think in life, I'm grateful that I got to experience, you know, both sides of the spectrum. Talk about all oh, take off for the first time. It's got plenty of green. Slow oh, getting up. Still not off. I got to experience being at the top of, of the mountain. Also being being in the valley, just being low, you know. He's putting no pressure on yeah. his right leg. The cart is being rolled out of the field as well. I just think it, it's it's good um, in a sense because that's that's just how life is. It's just life, you know. You win, you lose, you gotta move on, you gotta cope with it. Before I even picked up a football, I'd say my destiny is pretty much laid out for me. Samoan heritage, the culture, they play a big role in who I am as a person, who we are as a family. American Samoa is a Polynesian island that's in the South Pacific. American Samoa is still not modernized. We still have chiefs, we have matais, we have villages. Within their village, they live that life. Chiefs are still in charge of their families. My grandfather's last name was Afuola. They were blessed as being leaders and good speakers, orators in our village. They didn't have a leader over on the Tango Vailoa side. His mom's side of the family. My grandfather was chosen to go over and take care of that side of the family. And that's where we became Tango Vailoas. Everything to my grandfather and my dad was their name. Make it a Tango Vailoa name. He wanted to show the village that one day this name is gonna be a big name. It's gonna be a special name. And my father carried that to Hawaii. Ready? Go. Hey! When Nalu and Diane got married and she got pregnant, we were so excited. Of all the brothers, Nalu happened to be the first one to like birth this amazing child, and it happened to be a boy. My full name, Tuaninga Manuelipolo Donnie Tangovalo. 
He came into our lives, completely changed not only our lives, but our parents' lives. He was the first grandson, so this would be really the only child to carry on the Tango Bailoa last name. Your name in a Samoan culture is one of the biggest things. Your name is, it's like gold. It either makes you or breaks you. You represent what's on the back of your, your jersey. That's what everyone says, but I tell you, in the Samoan culture, it's not just what we say, it's what we believe and it's what we do. I remember daddy sharing how special to us only because like his dad had trained him at such a young age. And of course, if you've known Ngalu, Ngalu is also a great football player. And so he's gonna be training this son of his to be the best. But dad just saw something very special. And so they would always share that intimate relationship with each other about the importance of that last name. It was very meaningful. There was a lot of weight. I mean, the weight has always, it's been heavy on him. My grandfather was kind of soft-spoken, but when he spoke, just the respect he had, everybody listened. And he would prophesy things on us, his kids, and I would see those things come into existence. Just having him prophesy things on Tua was different. It was really, really different. My grandfather prophesied over me, and his prophecy was that one day when I grew up, our last name would be known all over the world. The way my grandfather used to teach me was he'd tell us stories. He'd tell us a story about the lion and the gazelle. And how they both wake up and they both run. One is running to something, and one is running away from something. You're either the lion or the gazelle. So, be the lion. Be that lion. Just gonna do one of this drill. Just push hard. Yeah. Are you ready? Now, drop four. Push. Good. My dad believes in hard work. Growing up in Hawaii, most people think going to the beach is, is fun. For me, it was different. Whenever dad said, let's go to the beach, it wasn't to go to the beach to actually, you know, swim. My dad's philosophy of going to the beach was to train in the sand. So that's what we did. Beach is always fun. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's, it's great because you get to look at that beautiful ocean. You're not going to swim in, but make good use of the beach. You're not there to take off your shirt, get a suntan. You know what I'm saying? You're there to work. When he saw the beach, it was work. Drive, 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 drive. Push. Pull the ball, let's go, let's go. Drive, 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 drive. Push. 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 It was just preparing him to be a good player. I want to make him the best kid in the state. 
Yeah, I want to make him the best quarterback in, in college. I want to make him the best quarterback. You know, you, you want to think that way so you can continue to have that drive to push. When we were raised in the tough love way, that upbringing resonates with you. What's important? That was just the kind of person that my, my dad was. And the biggest thing is Tua handled it well. Tua has tremendous respect and love for his family. That's the most important thing. I just wanted to make them happy and I wanted to make them proud. And the only way for me to do that was to do good on the football field. My Pop Warner career was, it was just fun for me. I just had fun. Was I good? <laughs> no, yeah, I, I would say I was, I was pretty good. We, we took him to camps, football university. We went to other camps. And, you know, because of what some of the coaches saw, they wanted to work with him. My dad wanted me to go to Punahou. That was the school that Barack Obama went to, Manti Teo went to. But Tua had more of a connection with the St. Louis especially Coach Vinny Passes, because he had been training with him. I think he started with us when he was eight years old. You know, even before his Pop Warner games, he would come warm up. That's why we decided that St. Louis was a good school for him. Nowadays, a 16-year-old Tua is one of the big boys. Going through that summer, he was competing with a senior. We gave all of those seniors a chance. Tua is a young guy, so he really had to work and compete. Coach Ron ended up having to make a decision, and I know it wasn't an easy decision to make. So I think he scored six touchdowns in the first game, sophomore, so I guess we know who's going to be our quarterback. And then his grandfather passes away. I got a call and we were at the house. I, I got the news from my mom and I got the kids in the car and we all went down to the hospital and went and see my grandfather. It was emotional, it was tough. Uh, yeah. My grandfather meant, meant a lot to me. He loved to talk after football games, so I'd go over his house with my parents, and we'd sit down and we'd talk for hours. He would talk to her, oh, you're gonna be great, you're gonna be the best quarterback. My grandfather thought everything I did was like the best thing, best thing ever, regardless if we lost or if we won. He would want to see him every day after practice, and then I'd be like, oh, okay, dad, it's getting late. Tua has to get his schoolwork, and..." He'd be like, oh, son, are you leaving? Or are you going to come back? And then I'd be like, yeah, I would come back. I would come back. And then I would go home. And my mom would call, your dad wants you back. The night of the season opener, which was against Punahou, to his first football game as a starter on the varsity team, um, in order for him to play in that game, it would mean that he would miss his grandfather's funeral. The thing was that my, my parents told me was, is this something, you know, grandpa would want? Is this, do you think he, he'd want you to come to the funeral? Or, you know, you think he'd, he'd want you to go and play in the game? I wanted to just quit. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of any of that. But when they put it into perspective, um, I mean, I, I, I thought that it'd be best that I, I'd go and play. I knew that's something he would have wanted. He would have wanted me to just play in the game and I mean, he did get to watch me play, you know? Somewhere else, though. Hit the spot, throw, see the cover, come on now. Set, go. It was it was pretty cool that I got the chance to go to the Elite 11. The quarterback Elite 11 kind of built an infrastructure where um, quarterback development wasn't training, it was as much mentoring. Teaching them and making them aware of these things we talked about, grit, resilience, um, leadership. We wanted to gauge him and see how would you compete with the best in the nation. When we had him at the regional, what jumped out was, wow, this guy's super, he has high horsepower, but he is all over the map. It's just raw. He made easy things look hard. <laughs> and said, so now where he makes hard things look easy. Yeah, when I first met Trent, Trent told me to stand up in front of everyone. To a stand up. You gotta get disciplined. Okay, you're a phenomenal athlete. You're a baller, but you have no discipline playing this position. I was set out to, to prove him wrong. I was like, Man, who the heck is this guy? <laughs> Naru got on the phone with Trent, 
And, um, you know, he's like, what does Tua need to work on? We need, we need to work on that right now. They went to a park every single day in Hawaii and worked on the drills, the, the foundational principles that we had introduced to him. He came back and went from being terrible at these things to the best I had ever seen at these things. I ended up winning the Elite 11, and I became the number one dual threat quarterback in the class. I've never seen one improve more rapidly than you. I am so proud of you that you're the 2016 Elite 11 MVP. Just like any other coach, right, when you challenge a kid on something and they come back and they, they do it, I mean, it brings joy to you. Like, wow, he took advice and look at him, he's killing it. It kind of gave me confidence to come into my senior year and try to dominate. You can now see how good he was going to be. That's when I, I started to get a lot of my big SEC offers. He's the highest rated prep quarterback in Hawaii history tonight. St. Louis class of 2017 All-State standout Tua Tungvaluwa ends the suspense announcing his collegiate commitment. I will be making my commitment to the University of Alabama. The story of the ego and the eaglet was a story that was told to me from my father. When egos have eaglets, they go down, they get food, they bring it back into the nest. They feed their young ones and they train them up into the day where they're able to push the baby off. If the baby's not able to fly on its own, the eagles swoop them up and bring them back to the nest to retrain them, refeed them, until the time where they're able to push the baby off. Once the baby goes down and is able to fly, then they let him go. I remember towards he liked to go to USC. That's his team. Tua told us, I'm going to USC, I said, Tua, you tell me you're the number one quarterback. If you tell me you're number one, go to the number one school. But who's the number one? Alabama. If you don't understand Alabama football, you don't really know the position of being a quarterback in Alabama, much less being the starting quarterback. You come here in Alabama where football is so important. These people live and die by it. They, they love it, and they love this program, and they buy into this program. Some of the three most powerful people in the state of Alabama, the head football coach in Alabama, the starting quarterback in Alabama, and then the governor. Here's this kid coming in from Hawaii, the magic Hawaiian, if you will, and uh, he was every bit of that. Well, he had a great reputation as a high school player. We, we thought, you know, if we could get this guy, he could really do something special for us. Coach Saban told me that I'd, I'd be given the opportunity to go out there and, and compete for a starting position. We know the situation that we were in when we got here. Jalen was the starter, deservedly so. Tua was the backup. I'm sure he thought that when he got to Alabama, he was going to play more than what he was going to play. Tua goes there and finds very early the loyalty Saban has. There's a sense that Saban limits your opportunities or your options. We knew what Tua's talent was, so we wanted to get him enough reps that we would get him ready to play fairly quickly. Every time I had my opportunity, I try to make it as exciting as possible. I, I try to score every time. He's still going to rip it downfield. And every time Tua played, he threw a touchdown. Every time he got in the game, he threw a touchdown. That's the backup quarterback. Remember that. Watch Steve Young there for a second. It was fun to watch Tua his freshman year because he was ready to play, and he was doing spectacular, fun things to watch where a coach would say, I want to see more of that. And then you start hearing it from people inside the building, like, yeah, every practice is, the guy's incredible. I think it's difficult to sit behind somebody and you really, truly believe you're the better quarterback. Tua's on the sideline, and it's not because the guy's doing anything wrong. It's because the guy in front of him, Jalen Hurts, is playing such great football. Alabama's headed to another national championship. And welcome, Chris Fowler and Kirk Herbstreit. We are so proud to bring you the championship game, Georgia and Alabama. Georgia was the only team in the country that I thought had better players. We had a tremendous amount of respect for Georgia's team. They had a really, really good team. 
about to get crazy. <laughs> this is going to be wild. I thought Alabama had met their match. In my opinion, the quarterback play for both teams, huge factor tonight. Jalen Hurts, what's the challenge for him tonight? He's got to be able to continue to do what he's done all year. One interception all season. To uh, was technically a backup to Jalen, but he was a guy that we could win with if he needed to play. I, I was always going to be ready. I'd be prepared. Have to get real loud, folks. Fuck him up. We kind of knew going into the game, we were going to need to be able to make plays in the passing game if we were going to have a chance to be successful. The way they're playing, the way Georgia's playing Alabama, you have to throw the football. Deep in field versus keeping a straightforward call, but it goes backwards as the dogs swarm. That first half, I was going to come in and Jalen was going to move to the slot. So we, we, had, we had a package like that, that we were going to run in the first quarter, and we didn't run it. Third and six from the pocket hit. Man, I was, I was like, dang, man, I'm not even going to be playing. Um, steps up, escapes, all in the room, and Fromm, first down in the red zone. 28 seconds left. Receiver comes in, they hand it, no, they keep it, and it's to the edge, the Dogs! Barking in the first half. In the first half, dominated by Georgia. We're behind 13-0. We weren't able to run the ball. We needed a spark. It would take a lot to pull a guy who's been clutching his career. Tungavaloa, who's the true freshman, wouldn't be surprised if he gets a shot. I said in the first half, I said, he's going to two in the second half. My thought was, if I was in Saban's shoes, I mean, am I really going to pull the trigger with a freshman who's never had meaningful snaps? The Dogs close it out, 13 nothing. You know, Coach Saban walked in the locker room where the coaches were going to meet, and he said, we all know the change that we're going to have to make. So the night before, we're at the hotel, just like any other game, and we're talking. Kids are playing the ukulele, singing music and whatnot. And so Tua comes in. He said, oh, mom, dad, are you guys ready? Are you guys ready? You know, and we're like, ready for what? He said, your lives are going to change tomorrow. All of our lives are going to change tomorrow. I told him, if I get my opportunity in this game, that I promise you guys, our lives are going to change. And then Nalo's like, look, you know what? Don't ask us if we're ready. We've been ready. You just better be ready. When you are given an opportunity, you better be ready to get in there and work. Coach Saban calls my name. He tells me that I'm going to be the starter for the second half. And internally, I'm thinking, you got to step up. And here it is. We were talking about Loa. Freshman from Hawaii gets the second half start. Street runs through freshman to true freshman. Started getting some completions, you know, making some plays. Throwing again. End zone. Touchdown! The freshman quarterback duel in Atlanta. The tied are back in. Some of the plays I, I never ran, but I told the OC, just call it and I'll make it work. <laughs> has all night hit hard, spinning around, trying to escape and create, and now he's in the clear. The freshman shows some toughness. Delivers under pressure. Downfield. Caught. Hartman escapes and scores. And we're going to say. Fires end zone. Touchdown. How about the posse and the boys by the young freshman quarterback sitting in that pocket? We're headed for overtime. They ended up kicking a field goal. It's a three-point game. You've got to make something happen. Now let's keep in mind, not only Bama scores a touchdown, they win the game. Look at Bailoa. Dancing around. Circling back. Drops! A disastrous first down play! You never want to take a sack, especially when you're that close to, to the red zone. So now you go from a rookie mistake to probably one of the greatest plays in the history of Alabama football. inserted in that 
position and do what he did, it was amazing. I'll probably never have an emotional swing ever in my life like that. They, they, they were the guys that made me look good to I mean, it, it was a team effort tonight, you know? So I get the two and I said, man, you really gotta learn. You know, you can't take a sack in that situation in the game. And he just looked at me and said, Coach, we just need more room to throw the ball. So I was like, how can I get mad at this guy? I kind of knew. I didn't know he was going to do a walk-off dime to win the game. But I knew he was going to play well. That's the thing that Tua does. If you're around him, you just know good things are coming. What an experience. It was great. It was great, yeah. That they really did change our lives. That, that feeling was awesome. Just being able to go up to my, my parents and tell my dad and mom, like, oh, we did it. After that game, my, my dad was telling me, like, oh, good job, son, this and that. But man, you, you, got, you got to be ready to, to, to do more. I mean, this, this is good, but you know, it's, it's always what's next with him. <laughs> it's always what's next. There's a guy right now playing college football that's taking the greatest program in the history of the sport to a whole nother level. Now he's on a national stage, and college football fans everywhere know his name. Sal, can you spell out Tungo Vailoa? Tua Tungo Vailoa. Tua Tungo Vailoa. Everywhere he turned, he had become a celebrity. It changed his life probably overnight. I've never, ever got to see myself on TV in that sense. He's got an infectious personality, unbelievably humble, just that smile. There was a mythology about him. You'd hear things about leadership, and you'd hear things about the human being he was. From his faith, to his football, to his arm, to his mobility, this kid is a complete winner. Tua throws the best ball, most accurate ball. He changed the way we look at Alabama football. Tremendous personality spirit, leadership abilities. I don't understand why this is a conversation. If you were to ask Coach Saban, there's no way he thought Tua would do what he did in the sophomore season. Touchdown, Alabama! Sophomore year, he's clearly the most dynamic player. Sophomore year, we're like, whoa, 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 whoa. What are we seeing? In the best defensive conference, he has the greatest passer rating ever. Then as a junior, guys like me are like, OK, where are the flaws? His accuracy, his anticipation, it's, it's not good, it's great. This is the reality of being great early. By his junior year, we have to pick him apart. He's not, you know, he's a little short. You know, sometimes he looks too much to one side of the field. You know, he's, he's, he's got injuries. I really worry about injuries. We had bad luck. And I think that started in the Tennessee game when Tua got his ankle injury. The big storyline and the headline this week, Tua Tonga-Vailoa undergoing a high ankle sprain. How many athletes, how many college football players during their career have sprained ankles? All of them. They all do. Tonga Vailoa undergoing the tightrope surgery, now on his right ankle, the same surgery he had on his left ankle. Two is two ankle injuries, uh, very common in football, and for a lot of those, we don't do surgery. We feel like with a, with a really severe high ankle sprain, the best way for that player to be able to be their best again is to do a, a surgical procedure. It's a very minor surgical procedure. We knew that surgery would not only get him back quicker, but also give him a better long-term outcome. He had the injury against Tennessee, and then he was ready to go against Mississippi State. And if you watched him in pregame warm-ups, and I did that day, I went out specifically with him to watch him, he looked great. Here's the left-hander to a tongue of Iowa. Down the sideline, touchdown! He was having an unbelievable game, maybe one of the best games he'd had all season. And Nick Saban comes into the huddle here, and there's two. He goes over to Nick and says, hey, let me get one more. It's just one more, Coach, what do you think? I asked Coach Saban because I mean, you, you want to go out there and you want to play. We're going to let him finish the first half. You know, we weren't going to play him in the second half. And then it was just devastating. Tug of Lois looking for more in the final three minutes of this first half. Comes out throwing. I, I try to escape the pocket, try to extend the play, and I... On the run, pressure from behind. I had two guys landing on me. I think I landed with my knee first. 
on onto the ground. Just about the full weight of both of them on uh, Tonga Bailoa there. He's down, and two is down. This is exactly what you did not want to see happen. I go on the field, I get down there next to him. He's on all fours. He's got a bloody nose. I mean, one of the, the worst bloody noses that, that I've seen in my career. His helmet came off. I couldn't tell what was going on. I, I think my body was just in so much shock that I, I can't recall what was going on at the time. We didn't know exactly what happened at the time, but we did know that it wasn't his ankle. Or like, it's something different. As we're slowly lifting him up, he says, my hip. And I kind of paused. And I looked. He's got a dislocated hip, which was as probably bad as it could have been. I knew at that point that we were dealing with, if we didn't manage this right, a career altering or maybe even a career ending injury. The cart is being rolled out of the field as well as we speak. It's scary being hurt, especially the big ones, the ones that hit you, and in the moment, you know, I may never play football again. He had a dislocated hip with a hip fracture. He had a concussion, which was pretty significant, and he had a broken nose. So we knew that all three had to be addressed. From a medical standpoint, that the quicker the hip goes back in after an injury dislocation, the better their chance of, of having a good outcome. And, and Dr. Kane put the hip back in place on the first try, and you just, boom, just put it back in. And then shortly thereafter, right, he gets airlifted, he's going to Houston for surgery. Everybody knows the gravity of this moment, no more than him. I'll never forget, we've got, you know, our star quarterback, he's laying on a table there in Starkville, Mississippi with a dislocated hip. Tears are just streaming down his face. I, I asked him, am I gonna be able to play football again? With, with all of this. Knowing that you get hurt like that when you're out for the season, I've had that feeling, your body knows something's wrong. When you're injured like that, it's like most of you's been taken away. Because you're thinking to yourself, I've spent my whole life for this. The fear was that he was just gonna break down and say, you know what, I'm done. But we're so grateful for his faith. I ask you according to your kindness. Just show your love to him, yes. whatever he is, and to him to know that you have not forgotten him. Yes, sir. And I pray this in faith, Lord, in your name, Christ. Amen. 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 I knew that once the surgery was done, we cleared the first hurdle. The second hurdle was wound healing. The next hurdle was getting the bone to heal and making sure the cartilage damage wasn't there. The next hurdle was the blood flow. If any of those things go wrong, then he's going to end up with a problem. You're sitting there, you're, you're injured pretty catastrophically. And you have a decision to make. Do I come back and play at a place that I love, or I go and chase my dream of playing in the NFL? He could enter the draft now on crutches, or he could wait. So in my mind, get the hell out of college as soon as you can. Why come back another year? Nobody really knows how he's going to progress. I mean, nobody knew. Coach Saban really just said, regardless if we wanted to stay or if we wanted to go, he was going to be able to support us. There's just a lot of unknowns. What if, what if I'm not even able to walk yet? What if I can't do anything? That was a tough decision. Right now, he's got to make that call. Oh, good morning. Uh, with lots of prayers, thoughts, um, and guidance, I have decided that I will be declaring and entering the 2020 NFL Draft. This is a big, big day for, not only for Tua, but for our family. And also our Samoan culture. It has been a lot of hard work, Tua. But now we're going into the draft. Whatever team that God bless your talent and your faith for you to be with, we're in support with that, and we're going to ride with that. So thank you, son. Thank you for everything.
Yep. Now, and I, I've been through the rehab process before. This isn't my, my first time doing it, but this, this one felt totally different. It was just slow, it was monotonous, it was just doing the same thing over and over, it was just repetitive. You just want things to go back to normal, but your mind's telling you yes, and then your body's telling you you can't do it. You okay there? Yeah. Nothing in the back of the head. That's it. When do we get the full go? Yeah, let's see what those scans show. Yeah. I know the rehab process was really difficult for Tua, especially early on, because we were very restrictive. Doing too much too early could either make the bone not heal or make the blood flow go bad. So to take an athlete like Tua and make him sit for three months, essentially, was really difficult. The CDC is advising older adults and people with underlying medical conditions to stay home as much as possible. This is not a sports issue. This is a public health issue. How do we slow this? How do we protect our players? Because that's the number one priority, Skip, is to protect their players. Colleges have shut down all the pro days. We're not going to have anything like the university pro day. Um, right now, the NFL shut down all their pro days. So we were, we're not going to be able to do a pro day at, at that date then, or maybe not even have a pro day. No combine for him in Indianapolis. Then he's living in Nashville, and a tornado tragically hits there. A deadly tornado ripped through Nashville overnight. It destroys his car. Oh, by the way, the car that he needs to drive three hours back to Alabama for his doctor's appointment. It kind of seems like problem after problem after problem. Like, everything's just been stacking up against me. So that's why when I, when I talk to you and I tell you, it, it's hard. It's hard. Nobody goes through this. That's why. Only Nobody. me. I know, but you gotta tell me you're doing something. Nobody knows, bro. That's hard. To me, the next two weeks is gonna be critical. If it shows that it's healing and it's going in the right direction, then they're gonna up his training. It's like you have a plate. People are trying to put food on your plate, but you're not hungry. Yeah. So it's something that you got to deal with. You got to know how to break this plate up in increments to where, OK, I, I can only eat this much today. Tony gives you this week just working out, yep. having fun, yes, sir. getting caught back up in school. Yep. Next week, if we're clear, oh, we're getting out. Oh. Thank this you. week's just about having fun again, getting yep. back and making sure that thing's good. It'll be good. Thank you. Okay. How you guys doing? So this is a... CAT scan, uh, looking at your hip today. So what we're seeing is that this piece is completely healed in. It looks like the fracture is healed completely, which is what we're looking for. Our goal was to see that this thing was completely healed and it looks perfect. So that's, okay. that's about as good as it can be. Awesome. awesome, thank you. Oh, that felt really good. Getting clear felt so good. It just felt like one thing was just lifted off of my back. Work's not done. My goal is still, we gotta hand this kid over to whoever drafts him as the best version of himself, because that was the goal. So now we got to find an undisclosed location that's going to allow us to have 10 people or less in a small facility to shoot something that we can get to teams. It was a challenge. Game day. You good? You good? Yeah. All right, good. Don't no, screw it up. No, yeah. Don't screw it up. <laughs> if you want it to the right or do you want it to the left? It's really right or left. Yep, I'll, I'll take it to the left. 60 is good, 61 we can take out. So then you have Popsicle. Now you have the uh, backfield seam. OK, so like she's on the right, left. Yep. I have no advice. I have nothing to be you. We're going 13 throws. Yep. It's rapid fire, 13, no 13, going 13, to your 13, knees, 13. no looking tired. I mean, you're a machine. You feel good? 
Body feel fresh? Do you need to throw much more, or could you go right now? All right. We're gonna show power, or show movement, or show precision. All right, let's have some fun. And everybody that watches this will say, oh, yeah, that's special. Set. Rip it. Set. Nice ball. Good, nice speed, nice speed. Oh! Nice. Set. That's what I'm talking about. Nice job. So all I've been hearing about this NFL draft is can't have a draft, we don't have a pro day. Oh, Trent Dilfer and Tua found a solution. Private workout, filmed it, sending a tape to all 32 teams. If you don't have enough information now with Tua, you're a crappy GM. It's all about the five spot in the Miami Dolphins for me. What's real? What is it real? Do you like Tua? Do you not like Tua? Do you like Herbert? Do you not like Herbert? What's going on there with the Miami Dolphins? Look at this, bro. It's my grandparents from both sides. It's going to be emotional. My parents don't know that I have this inside. <laughs> you see it? Tua, man. What's about this for you? I feel like Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor. <laughs> there you go, man. I look fierce. I look good. <laughs> I look real good. That's mine. PJ, what you think? Looks good, yeah. Does he look good? Better than me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, ha, ha. <laughs> There you go. You're looking at 60 remote setups of potential draftees across the landscape. We will have those reactions as we always do. The raw emotion when they come. And we understand the world that we know has changed and may be changing for the foreseeable future. But we are still here to be a part of what is one of the great communal sports experiences of all time, the NFL draft. If I only have one first round pick, I don't know if I can risk it. On, on to it. So many negative seeds were planted about his health. By the time draft day rolls around, a lot of experts saying that two is going to fall out of the top five. So where will he end up? There's no question who the best prospect is in the draft. You can't forget what he was pre-injury. My brother, you're in a wonderful seat tonight. Lord, whatever team is involved in the next step of his life, got to thank you that it's just the next platform he can honor you and enjoy the game that he loves so much. When I went out onto the lake, really, I, I, I just prayed. <laughs> prayed that when we do become successful, that this success doesn't change who we are as a family. Let us get this party started with the commissioner. The first pick, the Cincinnati Bengals select Joe Burrow, quarterback. Washington Redskins select Chase Young, Detroit Lions select Jeff Okuda, the New York Giants select Andrew Thomas. Dang, man, this is this is the moment I've, I've prepared my entire life for. And it's here, and it's about to happen. Here I am. What do you think of Tua here? Hello? Tua. Yes, sir. Hey, yes, sir. What's up, Chris? How you doing, man? Doing good. How you doing? Well, we enjoyed getting to know you through the process, and uh, um, you know, your love how you play on the field, how you carry yourself off the field, the type of person that you are, and player, and uh, 
Uh, we're excited here to make you Miami Dolphin, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate you guys, man. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, man, you did a great job, and, you know, you attacked everything and like you did. And, uh, like, you loved your story and done a lot of work on you. And uh, uh, Coach Flores, our owner, Stephen Ross, you know, got on the phone with him next. And uh, we couldn't be more excited to have you here, man. So, and I appreciate and, uh, it. Step one. Yes, sir. No, I appreciate it, man. I'm, I can't wait to get this thing rolling. Are you as excited as we are? I think uh, I'm more excited than you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> With the fifth pick in the 2020 NFL Draft, the Miami Dolphins select Tua Tagovailoa. <laughs> Thank you guys enough for the love and support. We're all emotional right now. Everyone here is just getting emotional. It's always been a dream of mine to, to have this opportunity to play in the NFL. Um, and it's not just my dream that I carry with me. It's my parents' dream that I carry. It's my family's dream that I carry. And everything that I do, that's what I represent. So I just want to thank all of you guys for being here in support of this event, in support of not just me, but my family. What promises can I make to my grandfather? Yeah, I can promise him that I'll be able to take care of our family. <laughs> I can promise him, I can promise him that when, when all of this is said and done, that I'll come back and I'll finish out, I'll finish out my life in Hawaii where everyone else is. I thought about my dad a lot. I just wish he was there to see it, you know. I wish he was there to see his name. It's a blessing that I was given the opportunity to take on my family's name and, and make something out of it. Your name is it's just the biggest thing. It's the biggest, it's, it's what you represent. Although many people may know the last name, I believe that it, it, it's, it's only gonna go beyond what we could have ever imagined.